Okay, so uh, so like I said, one of the, the the common theme here is how information is transmitted, how communication processes work, um, and looking at these things from a systems perspective, right? And and from that view, uh, you know, infection and mycobacterium seem to be a, the next level of the challenge because now you have two living systems integrating with each other. How do they tune each other? How, what are the systems level at which they adapt each other? Because we know mycobacteria infects the human macrophage and it can stay there for decades, you know, in a latent form. But for it, and macrophage at the same time is one of the most potent immune cells that we have in terms of defending against infection. So the bug has to get in, tame the monster of the macrophage and then, and, and not just for temporarily, but forever, I mean for extended periods of time. So, it is a fascinating problem of cross communication. So, in a sense, the next level of complexity one could look at and you are now looking at two, two living systems engaging with each other and very often one winning or you know uh, the battle. So, so that is what really got us excited into it. And then at that time we also realized that if you understood this, you may actually come up you know at least in theory, you may come up with a new way of drug discovery for at least mycobacterium tuberculosis infection because traditionally the strategy is I develop an antibiotic against the bacteria to kill it, succeeds to some extent but then it boomerangs on you because the, drug, the bacteria now comes back with drug resistance and that has been a huge problem in mycobacteria because particularly because the treatment duration is 6 to 9 months. So, many people you know moment you feel better you stop taking the drug. So, drug resistance spreads in large way and we have not just drug resistance, but multiple drug resistance which then evolves to extreme drug resistance. And more recently a year ago you know in, in Bombay they have identified Hinduja hospital they have identified strains now in patient which are resistant to almost any drug you can think of. So, what we thought is if I if we can the, the logic was starting from you know understanding the process, can you then use that process and manipulate the system or re-manipulate the system to prevent the bug from establishing in the in the macrophage? Because if we can do that, it automatically gets eliminated. And is that now an alternate strategy that you can employ for chemotherapy of tuberculosis? If it works, I mean it is still a crazy idea at that time. If it works, you have an advantage because this approach would not care if a drug sensitive or drug resistant bacteria no matter what uh, because they all have to adapt. So, if you succeed in this it should be equally effective against all of these strains number one and then this approach will also not drive drug resistance as rapidly in the bacteria as this strategy. So, that is really what we got into it and the way so, but the first challenge we needed to do is you know once a bug goes in obviously, it is manipulating proteins of the macrophage to control the function. And we had no idea what those proteins were that was really the first challenge that we needed to do. And so, we thought okay let us just do it in a big way, I mean let us just do it comprehensively. Um, and then at that time we had Dheeraj had finished his, his PhD and he was a postdoc with me and you know in a crazy moment let us just do it. And because when you say let us just do it what we are talking about is you, you infect the macrophages with, uh, with mycobacteria and then the idea was to do a genome-wide RNAi knockout where you knock out every single of those 18,200 odd genes that is what the library was at that time. And then you look for what happens to mycobacterial survival intracellularly when you knock down each of these genes. So, when we were planning we realized we did not have any fancy robotics we could never get it. So, the only way we knew we could monitor the system was by lysing the cells, plating the bacteria and counting after because bacteria you plate it takes about 2 weeks to grow. So, that became a labor intensive exercise because you are doing 18,000 genes and in each case at the end of your experimental period you are lysing the cells, plating the bacteria and waiting 2 weeks to see the herd growth. So, we did the calculations. So, so, we thought so that means we had to do it manually no robotic system and we calculated we needed about 18 people to do this and we designed an assembly line platform because there are different steps involved. So, we had each idea of each group of 4 people will do one particular step and only that step the Japanese model. So, that you do that to perfection because this is all error prone and any mistake if you miss your interpretations go up. Um, 
So obviously we had to do multiple rounds of this. So the idea is to minimize that each person is trained for one thing. So then we sub obviously you need money for all this. So we submitted a proposal to DBT saying that this is what we want to do. And the way we will do it is we will we'll take 18 students, 18 summer students who have at least 6 months of project work from their universities to do the job. But since we are going to work with virulent bacteria, this will all have to be done in a BSL-3. And we do not have a BSL-3 that will accommodate 18 people. So, we will talk with the local fabricator and build a new BSL-3 in 3 months and train the kids in 4, four to 6 weeks and do the thing in 1 year. So, obviously the, the review committee thought this was bizarre. You know, I mean the chairman said, ye India mein ye nahi ho sakta. And I do not blame him because it all sounded bizarre. First of all, build a BSL-3 in 3 months, I mean who would see, you know, um, and then get these 18 kids. But fortunately, at that time, Secretary Dr. Bhan, he loved challenges, you know. And I went to him, he said, uh, you know, you know, the committee is saying India may nahi ho sakta. I said, how do we define kya nahi ho sakta? And if you do not try now, when are you going to try? You should be afraid if I am too afraid to try. Uh, you, you know, and then he laughed and he was a great, I mean, phenomenal motivator and enthusiast. So, he found a way to give us the money and so on. And we actually did it. So, we actually talked to a local guy, fabricated that lab, he built it in 3 months. Um, it still stands in ICGV. Uh, in fact, that time many of these company with guys and all came and took photographs because India is now world famous because the only country in the world which has done a genome wide screen manually. And that is now put up in the Harvard Central that Screening BSL Unit. Very secure, yeah. yeah, in a BSL 3 environment. And then that, that paper we published and now put up in the Harvard or was at that time as you know as one of the model screens done. But anyway, so we actually did all that, trained the students, did it and uh, and and could agree. the first round we got 275 uh, key genes and, and then we took different clinical isolates, drug resistant, multiple drug resistant and screened again these 275. By then these students were gone so that only the more experienced people did this part because drug resistance is an issue. And then we could narrow it down to 74. And we also discovered one major mechanism turned out to be control of autophagy and so on. But the idea was the original thing is that if I, you now we know what these proteins are which the mycobacter manipulates for survival, if you can now hit any of these, does it provide a therapeutic option? So out of the 74 proteins we got, 25 are what you call druggable. That means they bind certain sites, uh, certain molecules like substrates and you can develop inhibitors. And out of those 25, 15 crystal structures and all were known. And we started collaborating with a pharma company in uh, Manisar called Sfera Pharma. And they had good inhibitors against three of these. And we tried that and, and, it, and actually this, it worked, the idea works beautifully. So in the initial you, you take infected macrophage, you infect with any strain that you can think of, even extremely drug resistant strain. You block any of these, they eliminate the bacteria. You, we could verify it in mouse models of infection. So we knew we had something, we had to now take it up to a drug. So the first round, uh, you know, we shortlisted the best, which is one of the proteins called GPR 109A. And then uh, a student I had Vashni, he worked out the complete mechanism of what it does. And it's a fascinating mechanism, which is, you know, the mycobacteria makes, forces the macrophage to secrete uh, a molecule called hydroxybutyric acid. It's a ketone body which actually diabetics make in turn, that trigger, that's a natural ligand, it triggers this particular receptor and that induces formation of, uh, well, induces formation of triglyceride balls called lipid bodies and the mycobacteria now goes and sits inside that and that's really in the human body only secure niche that it has because A, it is protected from all the toxic, toxic response of the macrophage because it's covered by a fat coat and in the macrophage the nutrient, nutrition for it is fatty acids and cholesterol. So, it is now correct, uh, surrounded in a sea of food. So, when you, what are inhibited is blocks activation of that receptor and therefore prevents the lipid bodies from being formed. And now the mycobacteria is vulnerable to the attack by macrophages and it gets killed and eliminated. That was the mechanism. So, now we know exactly what it does. So, the next step is, so we had a lead molecule, lead inhibitor molecule. So, we had to then do a lot of chemistry, it's again in collaboration with Sphera, optimize that, multiple rounds, optimize the pharmacological properties. So, we made 100 analogs, 
tested them, the good ones we checked for pharmacology, uh, you know, PK for instance. The one that good PK we shortlisted made more analogs. So that whole exercise went on last two years. And finally now we have actually a wonderful molecule um, which has very good pharmacological properties, uh, no drug-drug interaction, uh, it is stable in the presence of liver microsomes, it is stable, does not show any cardiotoxicity. And we have screened against a panel of 500 cellular proteins and no off-target effects. And very good uh, PK properties. In fact, we recently got the data in beagle dogs also. It's very, very good. So currently now, that's now our candidate drug for TB. So we're now at the stage of GMP synthesis. We have to do in vivo toxicity and phase one clinical trials. So hopefully next two years that will be complete. So that actually has led somewhere. We hope that goes further as a candidate drug. So. Yeah, I mean, not me, but you know, uh, multiple uh, workers are finding that there are severe limitations to the technology. Uh, it worked in the TB case because I'm not looking at the macrophage network per se. I'm actually looking at how the bacteria superimposes on the macrophage network. So I'm looking at a different set of reactions. As a, but normally, when people have done, for instance, RNA screens. For the same system, many people have done. Say HIV, I think seven or nine screens exist. If you look at the hits and overlap them, there's almost, you know, very poor, five to 10 percent at best. And that's been one of the concerns. Uh, and that's true um, in even in our case, when we did a screen for cell cycle using, for, using kinases and phosphatase knockouts, and we compared our data with data of other people who have done screens. We got about a 5 7 5 percent overlap with one and 7 percent in another. And it's not just our, even those two, if you, if you look at the overlap, is only the same. So, obviously, then that's actually that started a different trend of thought. So, what is the issue here? And what's the point then of doing the screens? And I think that's where, again, looking out of the box, I won't say thinking, but at least desperately searching out of the box helps very often. Um, then, you know, we realize if you look at information theory, what it says is all communication networks have what is called as a bow tie architecture. That is, you have elements that may sense uh, something, uh, a perturbation. That information is communicated to a decision making unit, and then that unit then makes a decision and directs the response appropriately. That is what you see, say, in a police system where the constables who see report to uh, the uh, control room which makes the decisions. Similarly, whatever information you put in your terminals eventually go to a server you know, and then distribute it further and so on. So we thought maybe what you are seeing in this SRNA hits are actually the, the, the constables out there looking at the environment. Uh, so, and maybe that's why that varies from cell type to cell type. In fact, that's one of the problem of RNA screen because the majority of hits you get, uh, well, one of the problems, of course, false negatives, false positives. And then many of the hits that you get turn out to be tissue specific or cell type specific. And so we thought maybe that's what we're looking at. And then we thought, okay, if that is the case, can we actually use this information to track the pathways through which they communicate and identify the core decision making unit? And since we are system biology, while I wanted to be system biology, that's a fabulous problem for us, is tracking the networks. You know, it's like you look at a constable when there's a danga and see how he's who is communicating to. If you track that pathway, you can identify the decision making unit. So we actually developed our own methodologies for this. And you know, we did some in interesting things like separating only those hits which affected each different phase of the cell cycle. So we separated hits which affected the G1 phase or the G1 to S transition or the S phase. So that this Havaldar is only responsible for looking at the S G1 phase. 
So, you could actually now separate the cell cycle into different phases uh, and then track the pathways and in a fairly complicated analysis. We actually managed to identify the decision, decision making modules for each different phase of the cell cycle. Uh, so, and, and so that turned out to be an interesting exercise. So, you could actually look at different dimensions of time and see how the decision making units evolve as a function of time. So, that was an you know, interesting uh, approach. So, you said the understanding of your understanding of system biology at that level or your personal accomplishment that made you think of you know, establishing a new center which I just mentioned in my intro. Right. The DRC which you just established. What was the motivation behind such a center? So, in fact, this very study was the f basic motivation because for the first time anybody had first captured decision making units and looked at how they function as a dimension of time. We knew exactly how the structure changes and what we could show in that study is now in the decision making you could identify the key guy, the CEO of the decision making unit in the G phase. Uh, in, in the G1, let's say early G1, the CEO of the decision making unit as it moves towards the G1S phase, the CEO changes. So now you know, so if you, if you hit this guy and this guy, you're, you know, you're collapsing two events that occur in time sequence and therefore very effectively collapsing the system. So that was kind of a new, at least for us a radically new way of thinking, use time dimension as a strategy for developing drug targets. Uh, and when we did that, uh, you could actually induce cells to go up, uh, undergo apoptosis and it did not matter what cancer cells, what cell types and so on. Across the board, uh, it did not affect normal cells. Only cancer because these are these, these things are working over time in, in a cancer cell. With a normal cell, they are either slow replicating or no replication. So, you can target fast replicating cells and, and these are distributing no matter what the tissue, you know. So, that we thought is okay, this is an exciting way of identifying drug targets because it is very complex issue of what are the drug targets and can we now develop these kinds of approaches on a larger scale and use this strategy for identifying drug targets because globally everybody is struggling, gradually there is a recognition that you need systems biology. We were in a sense at least in the front of the game, not just systems biology but using time dimensions and so on. So, it is a great thing for India to start because in India we have very primitive strategies currently for doing you know, old fashioned medicinal chemistry approaches um, because the two issues we know now that for most diseases one drug is not going to work, our drug against one target is not going to work, future is going to be multi targeted. The challenge is how do I know which targets to hit and currently the only way I do blind, I have 1000 proteins, I do all kinds of random combinations the space to explore there is, is huge, it is impossible. Our approach at least identifies, so we know this module, this module. So, there are 5 proteins here, 5 proteins here. This is the only combination you need to explore. And we have now developed tools to tell us which, who is the CEO of that, uh, who is the next general manager of that. So, we can identify the hierarchy. We developed some tools based on what is called graph theory. These are called between the centrality and whatever, but basically they tell you the relative importance and the manner of importance. So, this is actually what got us thinking and it is a great way, let us do it and that was the motivation to think about starting a center focused on drug discovery and the focus is actually on phenotypic drug discovery using the tools of systems biology. Um, so, that was actually the motivation and fortunately DBT was willing to fund it and uh, it is still in the process of taking up, but an interesting beginning. So. Ah, uh, no, no, I think I think Indian students are outstanding. I mean, for instance, the 18 students, the message I get everywhere is it can only be done in India. Uh, there were others who wanted to replicate the model. I think important to remember, 18 untrained kids did it and in the process beat groups at Harvard, Berkeley and Pasteur Institute Korea who have been planning much before us. Uh, because there are challenges and we could challenge in the robotic strategy and we could sort it out because we were doing manually. 
and there were others who also tried it, it wouldn't have worked, only in India. And, and I think that's because, again, our strength is Jugad, we keep forgetting that unfortunately, because it allows us to cross boundaries, I'll put it that way. You know, you can take, go out and take a decision whether you want to drive on that side of the road or this side of the road and, you know. But what I'm saying is that plasticity in thought, we, we see it as our weakness but actually it's a strength. Our chaos is our energy. Uh, we see it as a weakness. We're too much wanting to replicate other models elsewhere rather than strengthening our own inherent capability. Students are, I think, extremely more, some of the best, I would say, uh, in most, certainly from the most parts of the world. Um, how do you motivate them is a bit of a challenge because they come from a master's education system where they are taught to memorize every fine detail um, and then very often mentors expect strict obedience. It all depends on the environment because science is actually fun. Science cannot be a serious activity and it's a job where it gives you an opportunity to go back and become a six year old and play with your toys and thoughts. I mean, and essentially that's what it's all about, the way I see it. The moment you make it serious, it becomes a boring exercise. Even as a play, it's frustrating. It's like you play with a Lego, you can't build a six story, whatever. That's a natural frustration of enjoying, but it's a component of enjoying yourself, doing what you want. So, in India with our Gurukul kind of history is where the boss is supreme and God, I, I don't have an answer because you need more to, it's a, it needs to be a relaxed environment to motivate. Uh, conversations where you can challenge people to think more, uh, allow people to make mistakes. Uh, so that, those are ingredients for motivation. Yeah, how, how frequently it happens in Indian institutes, uh, institutions or universities is something I don't know. But certainly it's improved a lot more than earlier. I mean, many mentors I know who are my peer groups are far more chilled out than our mentors uh, and, and they're far more relaxed and actually I think that that's the only way to motivate and the mentors have to improve and I think that's happening. So, uh. so I need a period where I'm an absolute vegetable. You don't do anything useful, uh, and that's the, you know. And then you come back, and you know, it's like a Sunday is vegetable day by and large. Or when I go back in the evening, I switch off. I start early around three thirty, but when I go back, I just switch off. You know, and so and then just vegetable. You just watch TV or do nothing useful or constructive. I think that's that's the recovery phase. I guess I don't know recovery phase, but that's uh, yeah. Relaxing. Yeah. Dr. Rao, thank you so much for sharing your research, touching many aspects of B-cell biology, cell cycle regulation and transcription regulation. And also, very, we are very fascinated and very interest, uh, it was interesting to know how uh, elegantly mycobacterium tuberculosis is able to survive in host. And equally encouraging to know that uh, with the help of metabolic pathways, not only you can figure out how the organism works, but these pathways can be tricked into uh, treating many diseases and that's what you're doing with your effort in DDRC. So we really appreciate your time with us and thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. It was inspiring to hear Dr. Kanuri Rao. Thank you so much for being associated with Living Science.